I feel that teaching is a calling and it should not be misunderstood that I am in any way even remotely implying that there is uh, subjectivity involved. As a matter of fact, I would say that for every half hour of quality teaching, there should be at least half a decade of learning. What I mean is, is that uh, it really is a passion or it's just going to be transfer of information. Now obviously one must accurately and with precision communicate valid history. But the important thing has to do with understanding that by doing so this material has got to live and it's got to live inside the uh, the students and so therefore I say teaching is a calling because it does require of course study hours and hours and hours of study in order to get a couple minutes of information across. Background work is extensive, but you have to live the material and cause the material to come alive in the students. And in order to do that, it has to be approached as though it's a calling. You either are capable of infusing uh, a student with not only uh, material but a concomitant life force that that material will have. And you can watch, you can watch, you can walk around a classroom, you can watch people that are starting to follow what you're saying. You talk, you talk to them. Are there other people in the room? I, I, I can't tell you. In a class of 50, if I'm walking around and I see five or six, two or three, one, that's to whom I address everything. And other people then become in a condition of overhearing and want to get closer. And so, you know, it really is, and I resent people calling it uh, drama or th theater. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with uh, an understanding uh, of the material that doesn't require PowerPoint that does not require uh, someone following an outline that you've provided. Although, of course, one uses these um, devices, uh, but if one does, one runs parallel to them and never repeats necessarily what's on there. L let's say one is uh, in my larger class uh, showing a PowerPoint. Well, the last thing you do is read from it. You speak, you go, you understand your subject matter and you move the PowerPoint along so they get that information but you, you never interact with it. So too with uh, a syllabus. It gives the student uh, longitude and latitude but it doesn't tell them the depth of the waters they are in. And that's what it, it, teaching really is to me. Teaching to me is um, uh, plumbing those depths and 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 you know you you must do so from various and varying perspectives and you, you have to speak uh, as though you're writing you know watch your commas and semicolons keep language 
uh, very organized, and uh, stay just a little bit ahead of what you're saying so you, you never wind up um, in a condition of uh, stasis. It's got to be a, a living organism. A classroom has got to be a living, a living organism. And I'm speaking of the material. And I'm convinced, I'm 100% convinced, that the only time that failure takes place is when uh, the teacher loses his or her place or loses his or her passion for the material. When you're called to something, you know, you're infused with uh, a certain quality that um, is communicating facts, but doing so as would an old-fashioned preacher who rides from town to town communicate. In my case, the, go the gospel has all to do with uh, mu music, literature, and history. Well, that's the gospel. And you've got to know that stuff. I think it does serve a function that I have a background as a performing artist, a recording artist. I think that serves a function because although I don't necessarily refer to it, it uh, certainly uh, brings to uh, 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 academia a, a, a kind of a sensibility that I, I think is uh, uh, going, going to uh, in, in infuse the the communica communicate that's going to infuse the communication process with a certain uh, uh, inspired level that will be subliminal language. So teaching to me really is knowing what you're talking about uh, and having the appropriate degrees of which I have numerous uh, uh, examples of in my illustrious background, but it really does ride on that uh, ability to come up over the hill uh, with a force uh, that uh, cannot be reckoned with, that doesn't uh, attack, but that stands there. And uh, as it's backlit, the student really has to relate to these riders on the hill and try to figure out, you know, from what apocalyptic world have they come. Uh, if I sound poetic, excuse me, but I think that the ineffable is really what is uh, meant by being called to teaching. Y you must always remain objective. And uh, that doesn't mean that there can't be inspiration that uh, empowers uh, fact. I've made a decision not to write the book. Uh, there is a pedagogy that is beneath everything I teach. Yes, I have an interested publisher for that pedagogy, but I think that, yes, I've written, uh, you know, uh, perfectly usable, basic, simple introductory text for a particular area of American oral tradition music. Um, because there aren't any good ones for my purpose for that particular class, but I don't want to put everything in a book. And it, need I repeat myself, <clears throat> I've been offered the possibility and I've thought about it and I've started it and I've stopped it and I've started it and I've stopped it and I've realized that I'm stopping it because teaching should live in the air and it should be something that a student comes to. In my instance, I'm only speaking of my process 
And I don't want the feeling of, well, if I don't bring that up, it's in the book that I've written there. I got to bring that up and I got to get to it. And every class is a living experience. When I'm not here anymore, I would hope people would remember the lectures. And that means that the information is going in to a certain area and will be sustained bodily. I believe in l lecturing as more powerful than the written word in my instance relative to my subject matter and my process. Which isn't to take away from the marvelous books that that I use as texts. I'm glad somebody's done some things, but you know what? Each one is missing something. And my job as a teacher is to say what's there, to bring forward what's there, but also to speak to what's not there. And it is essential that teaching remain an improvisational, oral discipline. It's very important to me. It's very, very important to me. Like when I used to perform, I would make the recording and then I would be free. I would make the recording and then I would be free to perform it any way I wanted to. Well, in the case of teaching, I think that, uh, yes, you're right. It is like live music performance, but uh, it's also the case that um, it is something that if you codify you therefore don't have a certain ability to move around in. And so I, I, I like to keep my teaching content unwritten. It's the oral tradition of uh, academia. And when I was in my early years of undergraduate work, I had old time professors their lectures were stunning. They were stunning. I mean, you know, they got applause. They were just so sweet. Yeah, they sure, you know, some of them had written books, some didn't. But the point of the matter is, is that even if they had written a book, uh, they uh, didn't sit there and read from it. Well, I've chosen uh, thus far, I may change my mind, but uh, I've chosen not to put it all in one place so that I'm continually having to footnote, index, and chapter as I speak. Uh, it's 2012. I've been either doing that which I teach or thinking about it, or listening to it, or uh, a decade later, a little more than a decade later, actually teaching it. So I spent a long time with the material. I'm very familiar with it. Once in a while, it'll surprise me. And when it surprises me, that's part of the teaching experience. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. And that's why, you know, I'm saying, I'm not writing it down. Uh, I catch myself by surprise and I find myself with a revelatory accurate comment in the middle of a lecture that I really hadn't thought of before. Do I remember it the next day? The students do. Do I? Well, wouldn't it be fun to, you know, be surprised again? So I just like to keep, uh, and don't misunderstand this, part of the process of mystery to me. Because they're not bound, no pun intended, by a volume that they must absolutely know word for word. I mean, obviously I have textbooks in my classes. Obviously I've done everything right and I've done everything well. But, and so must my students. But in that, the, the classroom itself is a living experience. Yes, they'll come up with an idea. And if it's wrong, I'll say that's wrong. <laughs> but if it's right, you know, what I'll try to do is push more of what's right about that statement out into the, in, if I may, into the air from them. And they'll start thinking on their feet. And isn't that what a classroom should be? 
I mean, you know, I don't think you should be sitting in chairs. I think people should be standing and milling about. I don't, I, I, I can't sit when I lecture. I have to move. I have to pace. I have to walk. I have to put miles on. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, this is what a classroom should be. It should be uh, something in motion. It's only governed by when the, when the hour starts and when the hour ends. And I have to respect that because students have lives. And so do I. So there's a certain point at which it begins and a certain point at which it ends. But in that space, it, it is a... Is that me or you? That's me. Okay. It is, um, uh, it is uh, a classroom is a spatial element. It has an acoustic presence. You have the ability to raise and lower your voice. You know, you have the ability to maybe take someone's mind off the subject just a little bit. You know, what am I tidying up for? What am I going to say now? I must be getting ready for something. None of this has to do with drama or theater. I'd be a bad actor. I, I, I couldn't act if my life depended upon it. I don't act. But I think that you have to understand that you need to gain the attention of a student. If a student isn't paying attention and is sitting there, you know, doing whatever students do when they don't pay attention, leave them alone. Just get closer to them physically. Get within an inch if necessary. Don't say anything. Don't embarrass anyone. Drag them in. You know, what I found is that um, you respect a student's space or you intrude upon it in order to engage them and you, you, you get a marvelous, I'm going to use a word that I'll regret. You get a mystical sense of language and communication going in a uh, classroom situation. I go for that every time. Every time I walk into a classroom, every single time I walk into a classroom, it is in my mind consciously and unconsciously, when's that moment going to come? And I work toward it. When I'm there, I stay there for as long as possible, get everyone into that moment where all the material comes together. And then it's really important to back away from it real clo closely. You back away closely. And, y you know, you don't, you don't, for example, in recordings, you have fade-outs. Well, I've played live thousands of concerts. I can do that, S such that it's an acoustic fade-out. And then when you get to the end, you've resolved things. There's been emotion involved. You've got to time it just right, because the class is going to end now. And they've got it. It's over. And they're thinking about it when they're leaving. If I haven't done that, I failed. Do I ever have failures? You'd have to ask my students. <laughs> I never struggle with the uncaring quality of the student world, no. For two reasons. One is simple. They've paid their tuition, they've hired me. That's what they want me for. Okay. But I try. I try. And the second thing is that I'm in my own world when I teach. I mean, I make eye contact and I engage people in discussion. I communicate, but I'm in my own world. And that means that I am impervious to anyone who's self-distracted and or disengaged. I ignore them. If I can't engage them, and I've described to you how I might do that, I just ignore them. And it doesn't influence me at all, one way or the other. I'm in my own world. Now that should not be heard as a solipsistic world. I mean, the job of a teacher is certainly to bring people in. I try uh, endlessly. 
keep your mind on things. Don't, gosh, don't ever get distracted. You know, you get distracted and um, you're in trouble. You start going in a certain direction that is inappropriate to the flow of the entire hour, you're in trouble. So in answer to your question that you asked a while ago, I've never blown it. Have I been successful or not? Talk to my students, but I've never blown it. I don't, I don't blow it. I don't blow it. I have other problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been professionally engaged in higher education, teaching, since 1969. And I've never had, I've never had a class where there wasn't a moment of recognition that was shared. I've never had one. I'm not even talking about am I doing a good job or not. I hope I am. Of course you know that. But I'm talking about I've never ever left a classroom feeling that I didn't get to where I wanted to go. And I'm convinced that statistically at that moment in any given class, statistically most people have gotten there too who are there.